Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. And uh, I am tempted to speak some Korean, <laughs> but I will not. It's for your own good. I'll be speaking English so that you would pass the first test of teaching Buddhism to foreigners. You have to leave your language. And what else do you need to do? Let me clarify that with a few slides. And those who know my talks, you know that I don't use these slides very often. But for you, I do. I would like you to have a very clear sense of what the world is in terms of Buddhist teaching. We have two very big hemispheres. And if you see the difference between them, you can bridge the difference between them. If you do not see how they are different, you will carry your own habits, your expectations, and then that will be a source of frustration and a sense of failure. I don't want you to have that. So first of all, let's see how the individual, the family, and society works in either of these hemispheres. It's very easy to see what is the Orient and what the Occident is. First, let's get down to the very basics of how we view time and space. If you go to the West, everything tends to be linear and geometric. We have a beginning and an end. And we line up various continuum to form a matrix. And it's very intellectual. It's very structural. And if you approach the Western mind in a structured way, you give them a system, then they will understand you. They will even respect you. But in the Orient, the view of time and space is different. It starts with a dot, and it becomes a circle, and various circles, various impressions, various understanding, they merge, they combine. That's how we interpret the moment. So this is your moment, my moment, his or her moment, combining into one big moment of experience. This is not so much explicable. You can't explain this. You can only experience this. But if you approach the Western mind with experience only, there will be shy. They will be very cautious because they don't know it and they don't trust it. And if you begin with the essence that the essence of Buddhism is no name, no form, no time, no space, then they think you want to take this away from them. They think you want to take away their intellectual foundations, their prefixed ideas, and you shouldn't do that right at the beginning. You have to make them give it up. And if they understand you, if you do this right, step by step, then they will want to give up their own bondage because this is a very serious intellectual and existential bondage. It's a net. It is perceived of as a safety net, but it's not just safe. It's a wall. And if you are behind a wall, like a castle, you believe you are protected. And if anybody is outside, they cannot assault the castle because of the wall. But the wall keeps you captive in there. So the intellectual structures, things that we believe in, they hold us captive as well as protect us from the unknown. And this is something that we have to motivate people to transcend. Why? Look at how the group works. This is a strong hierarchy. Everybody follows the same principles, the same rules. But there's various ways of interpreting. That's why there are various colors, sorry, various shades in it. Roughly how the Orient works in an ideal case. It's a very strong hierarchy. It's a like, okay? So this is it. No questions asked, only affirmations, compromises, obedience, especially in this kind of strong hierarchy. In the West, it's a little weaker because everybody wants to have their own ideas integrated into the structure. Where is the me in the group? In the Orient, you do not ask such question. You merge with the group. You give up your own I, my, me. But in the West, we are not used to it. So if you start with this, that you have to bow to me, 
you have to give up your ideas for me. You have to consider me your teacher, then this will disintegrate. Then this happens. In the West, a broken structure looks like this. Everybody's following their own ideas. No more common value system. No more common ground. They, everybody does whatever they want. This is chaos. In the Orient, it can break too. But people do not lose, most of the time, their direction. They're disconnected, but they can reintegrate much easier. So this is a manageable chaos. That's a chaos beyond any short-term management. When you see that in your Sangha, you should turn this into this. And then it can be reintegrated into the previous strong structure that you have seen before. But in order to do this, you have to make these people realize what they want, why they came to study, why they want to meditate, if they want to get enlightenment, why they want to do that. So then we have an internal hierarchy. And this internal hierarchy in the Orient is very strong because you're educated to have this from birth, lifetimes. Okay? Now let's look at some basic concepts. And then it's easier to understand how the West thinks and how the Orient thinks. And of course, all the parallel qualities are present. They are not exclusive. What these will indicate is what the emphasis is. So first of all, in the West we have a linear idea of creation. God, whoever, whatever that is, created the world some time ago, and sometime later it will come to an end. Either as an apocalypse or going to heaven, but that's the linear idea. Although we don't know when that started and we don't know when it ends. In the Orient, it's not really creation, it's becoming, being born, becoming a sentient being, all right? And that becoming repeats, we call that cyclical. If you remember the teaching on the kalpas, for maha kalpas we are reborn again and again and again, and although we don't know the beginning and we don't know the end, we know what to do with this. We can stop the cycle. We can stop samsara and enter into nirvana. That's the teaching in the Orient. So one chance that you have with the Westerners who are sometimes very depressed about this linear creation, that it's actually not linear. It's cyclical. We repeat cycles. And if we repeat things, we have a chance to change them. So that's why the teaching on karma is so popular when you look at the past, the present, and the future. And then the cycles of past, present, and future, they start to add up. And if you change the qualities of the cycle, you have better lives, better deaths, better cycles within a single lifetime. Repeat after repeat after repetition. And then if you increase the quality, there's something better coming out of it. Next is the emphasis on the individual. We have mentioned that. In the Orient, the emphasis is first on the group, on society. Now, do not believe that in the West, especially in the United States, the individual is so easily giving up his or her own ideas, values, attractions, repulsions, etc. You have to work with it. Don't say that it's just illusory. Because then they say, your social values, your group values are also illusory. Prepare to work with the individual so that the correct integration would be possible into the group. And your Sangha is also a society. Please be aware of that. And the way you teach the individuals, that's the way your Sangha will form, will unite or fall apart. Because the individual needs autonomy. That's what we are proud of. And society needs integration. So the real question is, how do you cherish the integrated society without taking away the autonomy of the individual. Why? If you take away autonomy and have only integration, it's like robots. It's like a machine. If you have only autonomy, then everybody's doing whatever they want. Remember the chaos, okay? So there has to be a middle way, which I'll point out later. So the balance between the two is very, very important. And with correct practice, we'll find it.
in our Daesung Bulgyo, we have a treasure. We call that the middle way. So in the West, people love the middle way. It seems like the good deal, the right compromise, and it really is. So next is cognition. The individual, look at Descartes, wants to think. I think, therefore I am. So my thinking is so important. In this room, we already understand that conceptual thinking is a layer of mental creation. Not good, not bad, but not the final word. But because of cognition, people in the West are proud of their logic, proud of their thinking. And I know, it's their birthright, they think. In the Orient, many times it's arrogance. I know means you're arrogant. Why? Because you didn't say, yes, I do. If you say, yes, I do, you're doing it. You attain it. You experience it. And you don't talk about it. And because of this, in the Orient, you have this teaching, open mouth, big mistake. <laughs> yes, but if you close your mouth, sometimes also big mistake. Remember that very sad accident with Korean Air that crashed into Guam. The second pilot didn't open his mouth to talk to the first pilot because he didn't want to seem disobedient or arrogant and some information was lost and the flight crashed. If you remember the Sampung department store disaster, the management didn't talk. They kept the information hidden. So then closing mouth was a big mistake. But these days, you can see also in the West, they talk so much, but no meaning, or only my idea. So then open mouth, big mistake. We have to see moment to moment, keep it closed, or open it up or say something. And then we can see the function of speech, and then it can help us experience and attain. If we have a lot of thinking, we have opinions. And of course, opinion means basic freedom of expression in the West. So you cannot just tell people, your opinions are illusory, put them down. Well, if they put down their opinions because they love and respect you, what do you give them in return? Do you help them attain the truth? Do you give them something higher than their own opinions? Because if not, they feel you took something away and never gave anything in return. So observation is the key. Because if you teach Westerners how to observe, how to hear clearly, see clearly, taste, smell, touch, etc. clearly, that clarity is the bonus. You can tell them that if you really cut off your own opinions, your own thinking, your own dualistic views, this soup, this stock cook, will taste fantastic. Because your thinking is not blocking your senses. If you hear the Samuel Nori, okay, then this wonderful Korean music will just sound perfect because your thinking is not filtering it. So your opinions are sometimes the problem because it filters reality. It blocks the experience. And we have talked about speech. Opinion usually appears in some kind of speech and no one can or should take away the freedom of speech. We should just see its limitations, how limited they are. Because if we only talk, yada, 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 we cannot listen. That's the problem. Have you tried that you actually talk and listen at the same time? It's a great skill. And when you teach people in the West, and not just in the West, you not only have to listen, you also have to perceive what kind of mind or minds are right in front of you and adjust if necessary. Because of uh, a lot of cognition, thinking, and opinions, in the West, we are leaders with theory. If you look at science, it was born in the West. It was a reaction to religious limitations. And theory was the approach. And we test it in sometimes very expensive laboratories whether my theory is correct or not. Okay? In the Orient, we try to do it first. What do you say? When you want someone to try, to say, Hebora! Okay, so, <laughs> do it! <laughs> in the West, it doesn't fly. <laughs> they have to know why. They have to know what. And if you remember the first grid, they have to have a basic structural understanding. And at the end of this introductory, 
I'll tell you exactly what parts of the basic teaching I find useful for a structural understanding. So theories make systems. It's not just a Greek invention. The Romans loved it. Systems are functional. If we create a system, next step is automation. It's automatic, seemingly moving by itself or functioning by itself. But if you understand cause and effect or interdependence, we know nothing functions by itself. It's basic law of mind and matter. Thermodynamics and human interaction is the same principle. Nothing functions in an isolated environment indefinitely. It functions for sometimes, then the energy runs out or the information runs out, then the function decreases and it can disappear or dissipate. The West is very good with systems. Look at music, for instance, not just science. And improvisation is fantastic in the Orient, even with speech, <laughs> even with actions. You don't know something, it's not a hindrance. You just do it. You just reinvent yourself. The West has a lot of creativity and creative expression. That's why art has a different role in the West than in the East. In the East, art is made basically about entertainment or producing something pleasant. In the West, art is the direct representation of your creativity, your godly nature, that you can create something out of nothing. It's a very different idea. Use art. Art, for many hundreds of years, were like the bearer of truth instead of religious dogmas or premature scientific conclusions. So in the West, the expression of the heart or the soul is really artistic. And through the expression, we can learn a lot about ourselves. And actually, that learning was comprised later into what we call psychology. In the Orient, we love repetition. We repeat what our fathers and mothers did. We conform with society. And here, I have to tell you about a 20-something-year-old experience when this figure in front of you said, yes, sir, to a request. And the request was that we would teach English. Young monks at Hwagyasa would teach English in the Suyu Middle School. And we had the teachers, of course, not to the students, but all the Son Sang names, Kim Son Sang Nim, Park Song Sang Nim, <laughs> Yi Song Sang Nim, Yu Song Sang Nim, all were there, 20 something people. And I asked, Mr. Kim, what is the meaning of door in Korean? Then in unison, all the 20 something people, they said, moon. <laughs> I thought something was wrong with me. <laughs> and I said, Mr. Kim, I'm sorry for everybody else, but I am asking you specifically, just yourself, what is the meaning of chakmun in English? Everybody in the room, all the teachers said, window. Again, so, and I, there's nothing wrong with me, there's conformity. You cannot stand out as an individual. You cannot have just creativity and expression by yourself because it's considered egotistical, it's considered selfish, it's considered going above the norm of the group. And because of that conformity, people have a very hard time individually expressing themselves. Like, most of you have a very good understanding of English in this room, but how many of you would stand up here and speak English? Not that many, because of this. That's what you were taught. And in the West, when you teach, you have to give it some space. That they would actually talk about their understanding of the Dharma, no matter how basic or incomplete or inaccurate that may be. You let them talk about their understanding, what is meditation, even after one year. And then they think it's theirs, because they had their own thinking about it. They can talk about it. They can make their own little theory about it. They can express that. Well, it's a tough one. In the West, since it's an individualistic approach, you learn about freedom. What is your birthright as an individual? Many times it's very selfish and very infantile. I do what I want, I eat what I want, I drink what I want. That's many times Western style freedom. And in the Orient, after age seven mostly, you start to learn your responsibility. You are somebody's son or daughter, brother or sister, 
What is your social responsibility? What you have to do as a 10-year-old, 12-year-old, 14-year-old, 18-year-old, 28-year-old, and if you're not married, ha-ha. <laughs> that's your responsibility being avoided, okay? So look at that. And then you have to talk about the mind's freedom to Westerners. If you don't do that, you don't give them enough perspective. They just see the responsibility. In the Orient, as you teach, you have to talk about freedom, not just responsibility. If you just do the chegim, 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 it's your responsibility. People feel it's so burdensome. They don't want to do it. They already have enough problems at home. Now you put more onto them. So talk about the complementary quality freedom. And that is success. Duties are good, but make the two connected that the duty actually leads to success if you do it in the right way. You do your practice correctly, you can become Buddha. In the Orient, nobody talks about it to Orientals. It's not spoken of. You don't make promises, but in the West, without making promises, you have to have that success as a vision for the future. If you practice correctly, you can at least become clearer and happier and maybe enlightened too. And for that, we have to acknowledge one thing, one very important thing. It's our wonderful concept of Mahayana Buddhism, Buddha nature. That no matter what kind of eye corner you have, what kind of skin color you have, whether your nose is big or small, we have the same Buddha nature. We have the same potential to attain enlightenment. And when you tell them about it, you have to believe it. Because if not, it doesn't sound credible. It has to come from your heart, not just from your intellect. In the West, we love questions. Much more than here, in the Orient. In the Orient, when you say, yes, Sunin, you affirm, you confirm, you agree, okay? But this question, many times in the West, is lined up with everything else above it, so it's a very small question, very selfish question. And what you need to do is make that the great question. Immediately you can think about the Huadu, or what is this? And lead the question to the right place. The question opens up the mind. The definition gives borders to it, and dogmas put the mind into chain. Never be dogmatic about Buddhism. Never believe that you have absolute view. If you believe in anything absolute, you will sound very dogmatic and people won't like it. They don't think there's any freedom there. They don't think they can attain anything worthwhile there. So be flexible and bear the criticism. Because if people can ask questions, they will criticize. In the Orient, no way. You have to compromise. You put it down. You're the student. You cannot criticize the teacher. And it's true that checking, projecting, criticizing in the long run is not good, but you have to listen to feedback, whether it's spoken or unspoken. The feedback is very important and you cannot escape from it. Otherwise, in one given moment, the structure falls apart and you won't even know why. That means that for an extended period of time, months or maybe years, the teacher did not listen and did not see the criticism, whether it was open or implicit, silent. So the West is very much dynamic. We believe in ourselves, however illusory that self is, way more. It's not good or bad, it just gives us more dynamism, because we believe we can do it. Here it's static, you wait for the group, you integrate with the group, and when the group does it, you do it. It's different. But we have to have the balance because if dynamic goes too much, it becomes a revolution. And if you do the static approach very well, it becomes an evolution. And for that, we have to be very, very mindful. If you go back just 300 years, not more, in European history, we have so many failed revolutions and wars, because it was about just identity and territory and resources. And we never really evolved. We just repeated cycles of violence and useless disturbance and, and wars. So I think the best example is the French Revolution. We started with the king and ended up with Napoleon. And in 28 years, tens of millions of people died all over the planet 
because we did not understand what it means to have égalité. We won this in the West because everybody believes that we are created in the same fashion by God. So we are equal before the face of God. And that means whether you have God in the equation or not, we have equality between ourselves as humans. In the Orient, we have different karma. Good karma, bad karma, old karma, young karma. So it gives us a hierarchy, and the hierarchy you have seen before. So no karma is equal. That's right. But our Buddha nature is the only thing that can truly link us, because that is neither equal nor different. So the hierarchy and the egalitarian view, you have to have a good mind for it and see how much it is profitable and worthwhile to level with the student. It doesn't mean you take them as your equal, but level with them. Don't want them just to look down on the floor. Endure their eye gaze. Have an encounter. And that means you can empower them later as they practice more. Everything really depends on motivation. So the egalitarian society created a democratic system and an autocratic system is the result of a hierarchical view. And you might say that one is bad and the other is good, and this is not true. If you remember your history lessons, in classic Greece and Rome, there was democracy when it was peace. And when there was no peace, then it was autocratic. The tyrannos, or the dictator, took over, and there was a state of emergency. So even in Modern-day democracies, if there is terrorism, war, anything extreme like a natural disaster, there's a state of emergency, and some of the civil rights are suspended, okay? So you should see how much democracy there should be and how much autocracy there should be. I let the group decide or the leader decides, you decide. The balance between them is essential, and if you just go one way, it will be extremely vulnerable. If you go the other way, also very vulnerable. So the art here is moment to moment see whether you need an egalitarian, a democratic approach. You let them do it. You let them decide it. You let them have their own expression, their own system, their own thinking. Or you say, no, you must compromise. You must say, yes, I am the boss. It's an autocratic moment, okay? They should see that you do it for them, not against them. And this is the key. So when we say, wake up and save all beings from suffering, that has to be reflected in every single moment of your choices. Next, the West projects. We have a lot of ideas and we project it onto the environment. East rather keeps the ideas inside. Projection means I blame my environment if there's a problem. Interjection means in the Orient, you ask, where is my mistake? You look for your own, your own mistake first. Projection, you look for somebody else's mistake first. So it's externalized. The West externalizes many times more than the Orient, and with the next couple of slides, you will see why. The Orient internalizes. We keep things inside, but sometimes it's very dangerous. It reaches a boiling point, and since you don't communicate it, you don't tell your teacher about it, you do not want to bring bad news, you don't want to impose your karma onto the environment, there is either a depression or an explosive, obsessive, compulsive behavior. That's when people do stupid things. In the Orient, they call that the wind of karma. When the wind of karma blows through your mind, and then you are not yourself. Yeah, because your karma reached a critical mass. You kept it inside, bottled up, pressure increased, boom, explosion. That's when there's a lot of shouting. In the West, we start with matter many times. It's a very materialistic approach. We have over 400 years of super heavy science trying to get back our own experience of the world. Not dictated through religious dogmatism, but actually using our own eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind to directly attain what this world is, what life is, what death is. And remember, in 1600, Galilei almost died for it. He had to recant all his teaching. Only on his deathbed, he said, Epur si move, yet it moves. 
because he had to deny that the earth is moving. Uh -huh. Our own experience is very important. And that's when mind comes to the center. You have to teach correct mind practice, which means if your mind is clear, everything is clear. If your mind is not clear, nothing is clear. And then people will believe you because you don't cut the connection. In fact, you connect mind and matter, transcendental and sensual. The central concept in the West is salvation. If we have a problem, we need a salvation, some kind of heavenly source or any kind, but we expect that our projected power somehow gets back to us. You pray and you get good results, okay? If you teach Kido practice, don't teach it as prayer. Teach it as transformation. You transform your mind and then you get enlightenment. Even if it's a small enlightenment, don't make it too big, don't make it complicated. Even if it's a small awakening, it's the right step towards the right direction. Because of the salvation view and externalization, many people in the West believe that we have fate. We have a prescribed destiny. That destiny controls us. Well, we know that karma can be looked upon as something immutable, but this is not true. You can change your karma. And if you change your karma, then you have a path. And if you walk on the path, you attain liberation from that karma because your karma does not exist by itself. It's a huge difference. Many times when you think of karma, people think of fate. That's your karma. You must be like this. No, no, no. I don't have to be. I just have to see what karma is made of, what myself is made of. I change the ingredients. I change the components. Then the ultimate result also changes. So the worldview summarized. In the West, it's monotheistic. It's very externalized. There is a creator outside of yourself. Here, in the Orient, it's a mental creation. Avatamsaka Sutra, Hwam Kyong, Yorabun. If you want to understand the nature of this world, perceive it as created by mind alone. Very different. This mind is ours. Not just mine, yours, 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 everyone. 7.3 or 4 billion human beings create this with our minds. This is a huge difference and you have to capitalize on it. Most people in the West do not believe in God Almighty the way the church wants. So we have now four very important figures on each. And if you want to do your own homework, you can read into it. How this monotheistic view came about, we have several paradigms to build on. One is Moses, father of Judaism. Jesus, father of Christianity, which is not just Catholic, but also Protestant together in this usage. Mohammed, who is the Islam, and I have to put there St. Francis of Assisi, who actually renewed Catholic faith in ways that was not foreseen. And the results are still echoing in the chambers of the church. In the Orient, we have four very important figures. One is Buddha Shakyamuni himself, and he was wonderful enough to talk about past Buddhas like Deepamkara, Kashyapa, and also future Buddhas who come after him. So he didn't single himself out that I am the sole representative of enlightened consciousness. There were Buddhas before me, there will be Buddhas after me. Very important point. Then came Lao Tzu and Confucius, and in Korea, Yukio, Tokyo, and Bulgyo, they all mix. That's our treasure. And now we have an important thing to do. A Confucianism sometimes is very attractive because it actually tells you what to do. But if you mix Confucianism with Buddhism, it's a very, very stiff result. So don't mix Confucianism with Buddhism. See the Buddha's teaching, see your own cultural tradition, and leave your culture at home when you teach abroad. If you don't do that, then people will take you for a very nice Sunim or Bosalnim or Gosanim who teach Korean culture. That's wonderful. That's not your purpose. Your purpose is teach something which is beyond cultures. You know, without Taoism, we would not wear gray and we would not be flexible. We would not have geomancy or Pungsujiri. And we would miss a lot of the poetic and simple representation of the great way. Okay? So the synergy between Buddhism and Taoism is one of the happiest marriages 
in world spiritual history. Two very mature and grown-up traditions completely merged in China during hundreds of years. The result is Son Bogyo, or Chan, or Zen. And Bodhidharma, why I put in parallel, because he renewed Buddhism pretty much in the same way as St. Francis of Assisi renewed Catholicism. And of course, the two individuals were two completely different characters, but their roles were pretty much the same. So Bodhidharma, about a thousand years after Shakyamuni, he solidified and codified the four principles of Zen. The four principles of Zen, as I talk about it a little later, will be the hallmark of our teaching. It will set us apart from anything structural or religious or too systematic. In the West, we have God and man. Creator and created are separate. Because once you are created, that's it. You cannot get back to God. Maybe after the last judgment, if you were a good person. Maybe. Buddha nature in all phenomena, creators and created coexist. That's a very, very radically different view. Use it. This gives you the equanimity or the egalitarian view without losing the hierarchy. This gives you autonomy with cooperation. This gives you freedom and responsibility together. Is Buddha nature how we create the world and how we experience it as a created world is supremely important and the key is this moment. That's why the moment teaching is important and please do not just repeat the here and now. New age has already abused here and now many times. Why this moment is important? Why we practice that? Why we attain that? Very, very clearly represented in the previous 25 minutes. So the West, because we want to approach God in whatever way possible, we want to have absolute truth. Perfect, eternal, and self-existing. And it takes a lot of suffering to realize that there is no absolute truth. Phenomena are all relative. The moment you open your mouth, your speech is subject to interpretation. All phenomena, imperfect, impermanent, and interdependent. This is basic Theravada, okay? So it's the nature of life, or the nature of phenomena on this world. And if you teach that, then this prison of absolute view, that you must be perfect, you must fight for eternity, and you find, have to find something self-existing outside of yourself, this struggle stops. And then we arrive to the point of truth. And then we can experience our essence. Because in the West, traditions, they supplant each other. They cannot coexist. Heresy and pagan, these two concepts, they do not really exist in the Orient. They only exist in the West. When one religion said about another tradition, you are heretic, and I wipe you out. In the Orient, it didn't exist. Look at Buddhism. It incorporated the mudang, the shaman culture here in Korea, incorporated Taoism, as I have said, incorporated Confucianism. So traditions build on each other. Use that combination. Use that synergy. Use that relativity, flexibility, and then you can adapt then you can be very valuable. And just a little bit of logic. I'll be easy on you. This is not going to take too long. But look at Aristotle. He had very strong principles, and actually, he really didn't follow Plato, his teacher. He followed his own intellect, all right? He had things and people to build on, but the mystical Pythagorean truths, they are all lost. A equals A, B equals B. They're mutually exclusive, so A never equals B, and B never equals A. That's how math was born, although way before him, other Greek and Islam scholars, they built mathematics from a very different source, too. So form never equals the content, and content never translates into function. They are seen as discrete entities. But in Nagarjuna, the 14th patriarch, we have something very interesting, because it says, of course, A equals A, B equals B, but the essence of A is the same as the essence of B. That's the root of our teaching on Buddha nature, enlightenment nature. And then, out of A, I can transform 
into B and from B into A. And ladies and gentlemen, sunims, bosalims, and gosalims, that's the big difference between an extreme isolated view that good and bad are always separate and they're self-existing, so people are inherently either good or bad. No, 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 we have the Wu Qi, the empty circle, and out of that came the dualities, the Tai Chi, and if necessary, we transform this back to emptiness and emptiness back to form. But the West is not capable of that. Until they started to have these big particle accelerators, they did not have an understanding of form transforming into another form and being just pure energy. We had to go through materialism. We didn't have Shakyamuni Buddha, but we had Albert Einstein. He taught about relativity, and through material approach, we arrived pretty much at the same view as was being taught by Shakyamuni, Nagarjuna, Tibetan, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese patriarchs, so that we could train our minds to reality, the way things actually are. So now, let's go back to the very beginning and build up something different than just dualistic qualities. So we just talked about Buddha nature, or oneness, and then the key word here is non-duality. You have to give it to them, to your students, something to attain, something higher than just being torn apart into black and white. That means you have a transcendental view. You transcend enlightenment and salvation, God and man, samsara and nirvana. Transcend all of that, and then you arrive at the point which we call no name, no form, no life, no death. We call that don't know. But a moment of silence is better than any kind of explanation. Remember, the West needs explanation. But after the explanation, don't say anything. Return to not knowing. Return before thinking. And by then they will understand why. They will trust you. They will believe you. They will rely on you. Mind and matter. Don't see them as so much separate. See it as a stream, a stream of experiences. Remember the mind stream from Theravada. There are four levels of jhana. And the first is the stream enterer. Use that. Okay, the shrota apana, the stream enterer. And of course you can go to the anagami, shakidagami, and arahat. No, no problem. The other three levels are a little bit higher. But anybody with sufficient meditation effort, they can enter the stream. Something happens and they start to see their minds. They start to see their karma, how it forms this stream of consciousness. Then the matter, sensory experiences, combined with the mind, that you can see the stream. That's correct. That's correct experience. And then we are not kind of fallen apart into either one of them. We talked about relativity. I don't have to explain that right now. We talked about the various functions of various group forms or, or group ethics. And I think this kind of functionality is something very concrete and very believable. How we work together, how we act together as a group of humans. Then we have a correct situation instead of just static or dynamic. What is our correct situation? Do something radical or wait and be patient? And instead of just questioning or compromising, see your correct relationship. I've said that before. Is it correct to say something? Or is it correct to shut up? Moment to moment, see the relationship clearly. Then it becomes a motivation. Because you have something. You have something that motivates you to practice correctly and be a correct person. Produce less suffering and produce more happiness. Then you can serve others. You can help others. And that help comes back to you, not as a kind of business proposal or a memorandum of universal understanding, but really you help this universe and the universe helps you back. Then we have a higher purpose than just theories or improvisation. Then we have the perception that we need, and perception we have to stop here, because there is a Sanskrit word for correct perception, it's called tathata or suchness. This tathata or Bhuta Tathata, is the key concept for Sonbulgyo. Because it's neither good nor bad. The sky is not high or low. The sky is blue. People are not good and not bad. But they are just like this. 
So it's just like this perception gets you to this clear mirror consciousness. This clear mirror mind is our treasure. That's rooted in non-duality. That's the function of transcendental wisdom. That's how you can perceive your situation, relationship, and function correctly. And then we get to a very interesting point that instead of thinking, we have a paradox. Paradox is the key that opens the door of the mind to something higher than just cognition. And that's when we have the kongan. And the kongan is not huadu. Huadu is only one, ige mo shinga. What is this? This is the huadu. This is the key that opens many doors. We have Blue Cliff Record, we have the Mumon Khan, we have uh, many kinds of collections, 1,700 kongans, or 365, or 208, many kinds of kongans. But if we do not make friends with the paradox, we cannot open the gate. Then we attain balance. Logic chops everything down because we want the system to be correct. The paradox includes everything because we tolerate contradictions. We tolerate unresolved states of mind. This paradox gives us balance. I don't like you, but I tolerate you because we want to work together. We live on this world for a very short time, yet we want to attain something beyond life and death. Humans and this planet are not really compatible, yet we want to make peace between ourselves and this planet. I've just told you a bunch of paradoxes. Live with them. Do not disregard them. Don't think they are mistakes. See your own contradictions and build good paradoxes. And if you do that, then balance appears. And if you have a balanced view, balanced body, balanced mind, you attain this moment. And then it gives you correct willpower, correct strength, correct endurance. Because ultimately, that's what we need. But if you don't get it the right way, we'll lose it, okay? So remember that this middle way builds up to something beautiful, something worthwhile, something that has wisdom and compassion. So let's get to the primary teaching structures. And I know that many times we shy away from this because they seem to be too big of a subject. We don't want to deal with them, but we have to. Do not give the fine little details of Buddhism. Get down to the basics again and again and again. So begin with the Four Noble Truths, okay? And mention not just the four great sufferings, birth, old age, sickness, and death, but use the four lesser sufferings, not getting what you want, getting what you don't want, being, the, being in the company you don't like, and not being in the company that you like. Use that to point out basic truths about life, about the way we live. And the four principles of Zen, as I've said during the Bodhidharma presentation, I think it is the ark and stone, the most important part of our Sonbulgyo. So point out that we do not depend on the scriptures. We use the scriptures, but we don't depend on them. We directly point to human mind. Attainment, enlightenment does not mean anything else than attaining our true nature. Nothing special abilities, no healing capabilities, no big wonders, miracles, because people expect that. People expect that they would be soothsayers, healers, walkers on water, miracle makers, magicians. You have to take all that away. Carefully, compassionately, but you have to have the wisdom that enlightenment means attaining your true nature, which is beyond life and death. That's it. Nothing more. And then, transmission from mind to mind. Okay? So not depending on the scriptures, directly approaching to human mind, attaining your true nature means you become Buddha, and mind-to-mind -mind transmission. Now that's what sets us apart from anything religious, anything systematic, anything structural, anything just based on definitions, all right? And the Zen circle, the Zen circle is something you can read in Sung San Sunim's teaching. It has five major and important points. I'm not talking about it right now because this and the other two can be the part of a next lecture on methodology if you are interested in it, but now it would make it just too long. The eight levels of consciousness, you can read it in the compass of Zen, how your body and mind interact 
and present that as a very good and open system because it talks about rebirth and talks about this lifetime and the body and mind, how they work together. And then the three essential elements in Zen, do not lose the question. Keep your Hwadu alive. Have what is this, moment to moment, without words, 360 degrees open in your mind. And then you have great faith. You can build on the experience. You can use your mind correctly because your mind is clear because you kept your great question. The great question keeps your mind clear like space, clear like a mirror. No dust can settle. Nothing can break it. Okay? Body easily broken. Mind, if you train, not so much. And great courage comes out of that. And you saw the willpower or strength on top of the list. That's what comes out of courage. And the secondary teaching structures is when you use the 12 links in the chain of dependent origination, the Praticca Samupada, as linked to the Four Noble Truths like the cause of suffering, and do not do this just with life and death. Do this with any kind of idea that the person has, that you have mental formations, you have a certain type of consciousness, you want to have a sensory experience, then there is having and not having, and then the cycle begins. How you create this world, how you create it with your mind. The 12 links in the chain of dependent origination is a fantastic footwork. It's a very good blueprint for that, okay? Noble Eightfold Path, this is pretty clear, but you have to point out what is the correct. So, yeah, correct view, correct speech, correct meditation, correct livelihood, correct action. We know that. What is it that makes it correct? Then we, we can talk about the four kinds of karma because we have listed all of them. Individual, dual, that means with a partner or a significant other, family and society, how these four kinds of karmas relate to each other, then you are not kind of tied up with any one of them because everybody is born into a family. Most people, even if they became sunims, had some experience with another human, intimate and close, and then decided not to pursue family karma. And these four kinds of karma deserve equal respect. We do not say that one is better or worse than the other, but we should see where our path leads. And if you cut your hair, that means you don't build a family and you don't have a, an intimate partner. You integrate the individual to the society, to the group directly. If you don't have monks or nuns karma, you have family, flesh and blood family. You have a significant intimate other with you. But since all karma have the same nature and the same kind of function, all kinds of people can get awakening. Kongans, we use kongans to build paradoxes, to have the mind function in unpredictable ways, yet clearly. Practice methods. Don't miss any of uh, these three. Bowing, chanting, and sitting. Bowing is really like breaking ice. Breaks the ice of the karma and those who finish their Sami Samini training, they know what I'm talking about. You bow a lot. Otherwise your mind drives you nuts. Crazy. Too much. Too much karma. So you bow. You really put the Buddha to the top of this hierarchy which I've said before. And then every other karma follows. Everything else lines up because Buddha is most important. Your Buddha nature is primary. Everything else underneath supporting that. Chanting is like boiling the icy water. Icy water is still very cold. Not solid. Doesn't kill you when it hits you, but still very cold. So when you do Kido, you transform your mind. You chant Kwan Bosa, become compassion. You don't chant to somebody external. Remember the externalization problem? People think there's an, that there's an entity, there's a being. We don't know. But we can transform ourselves into the mind of Kwan Sam Bosa if we chant correctly. Then sitting. Sitting is like having these clouds and the wind blows the clouds away. So breaking ice, boiling the water, dispersing the clouds. Remember that because sometimes people only want to sit and their karma hits them like an iceberg. And even the most titanic ship can sink. And some people saw only Buddha statues and they think that practice is sitting. Well, bon appetit. 
when you start to sit and you didn't do bowing and chanting, it's really rough ride. It's really like a horror movie hitting you right in the face. Or another kind of movie, another kind of movie, whichever your karma projects. But people believe that this is practicing. No, it's just your karma. That's not practicing. But if you start with bowing, chanting, and sitting parallel, simultaneously, then you give them a system. Remember, Westerners love systems. I do too. That's why I made this presentation for you. <laughs> so uh, don't judge people during meditation at all. Don't judge their karma. Don't want to make them better. Don't hurry. And be strategic. Be consistent. Uh, do something that really helps them, that keeps the group together in a very simple way, that cannot de be misinterpreted. And then this meditation community grows like a wonderful lotus grows out of the mud. And lastly, before I take any questions, remember that if you don't know something, it's fine. But if you presume to know something, yet you don't, that's what gets into trouble. Okay? It supposedly was Mark Twain, but maybe I'm mistaken. And thank you for your attention. I really appreciate your uh, bright eyes and intelligent eye gaze. And now I would humbly and kindly take your questions. Okay, combination or uh, between uh, the, the way between the Western culture and Eastern culture, or the transcendence of the two cultures. Um, maybe that, that is the middle way, or both. Actually, if you transcend the cultures, you can find a balance between them. If you do not transcend the cultures, you will want one to dominate the other. So transcendental view is not somewhere out there. Transcendental view is non-attachment, non-identifications, no projections. That means balance and correct relationship and correct function to each. Do you think in the 21st century that these two polar opposites, the two hemispheres, are merging? Like Western thought is becoming more integrated into? That happened already. In fact, we are dependent on each other more and more because we are not just living in a global village. We are using the same planet, whether the sun rises at GMT or GMT plus seven. Mm. So we are using the same planet, the same resources, the same soil, the same sea or seas. And if we don't realize that, then we talk by each other. We don't meet. We have to meet. If we don't meet mentally, we cannot sustain our material existence because resources are being depleted by the East and the West at the same time. And we each have our own ideas. And on the platforms of when we talk about climate change, when we talk about uh, related qualities of peace and war many times, then we are on the same platform. And we have to be. In fact, uh, you can see, you have been in Korea for quite some time, how Western thought was being exported to Korea together with religion, material, culture, even the way to make cars. And Asia has become better at that than we are right now. So watch out. We have to be better also. We have to have more introspection, more together action, more integration in the West. We have to approve we have to acquire the Asian values, not just export our own. Because if we go like this, then the best pianist, the best preacher, the best scientist, and the best car maker will all be in Asia. What I'm, actually, what I'm thinking is for, um, in terms of the spread of Dharma, not everyone in our audience will go to the West. But don't you think these principles apply to the young the M generation, the X generation, in Korea. Very so important point. in order point. to and, spread the Dharma and in Korea. And the answer Korea. is a resounding yes. So in order to, to teach young Koreans, this is also very useful. Because the new generation, they're brought up by Western principles many times, not just your own wonderful cultural tradition, centuries or even millennia old. So 
youth in Asia are dependent on the West in so many ways that if you want to approach young people, you probably will be using some of this or, or all of this. It's a very big question of life and death, survival or demise, whether Korean Buddhism can use renewed methods to approach young people, answer their questions, and make the essence of Buddhism available and attractive to them. If you look at temple goers, those bosanims who go up to even very remote areas on foot, carrying rice on their backs up to Bongjongam or up to Mangwosa, hard to reach places, how old are they? How long will they live? How long will they be able to support Buddhism? Their belief is unshakable. They believe in the path so much they support the bold-headed because for them, we are potential Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. How about the young generation? What do they listen to? They never follow this mind. They don't have the Shindo Maun. What do they have? Start with that. Don't judge that because it's different from their grandmothers. And for them, for the 20 years, you cannot present Buddhism as a religion, something just to believe in. You have to present it as something that they can use. And you teach them how to use it. Then they become better people because they actually have some experience of the path, some kind of clarity, and then they believe in you more. But the approach has to be different using Western cultural ideas or even experience if you visit. If you visit, and I hope one day we can all practice together in our beautiful place in Wonkwangsa, we have, I think, a combination that is intending to give you the best of both worlds. And then we can see that people feel something genuine. People are interested in this. They can use this. And of course, in Korea, there are many temples that are open to Westerners. And it's wonderful to see that. They're open to more Asian countries than just Korea. And that kind of combination gives us a combined view. If you have an object, and you have light on this, from this angle, then there's a shadow on the other side. If you have light from two angles, then the shadow decreases significantly to a very small area. If you have light at this from three, four or more angles, the shadow can completely disappear. That's how the teaching can work in the eyes of many cultures, from the view of many people. And I think we should use that and put our wonderful teaching the path into the future, onto solid grounds again and again and again. Because the world is changing very, very quickly. We have to adapt without losing our values. Uh, Korean Buddhism include Korean culture. How can uh, this distinguish culture and, uh, uh, culture and Buddhism, Korean Buddhism? Use the culture, don't attach to culture. You can use and you should use your Korean upbringing Korean Sunim Sankwal, the Sunim's life, but don't attach to it, don't expect that to be echoed or repeated in the West. If you really go to the West and start to teach there, then perceive the mind of the audience that 70%, 30% is the actual teaching effort. But that 30% depends on the 70. So see what they are interested in, see their questions. Don't just press the button and Korean culture with Buddhism appear. Because soon you will lose meaningful audience. If you answer their questions, if you help their problems, if you honestly walk together with them on the path to enlightenment, then all your Buddhist culture, Korean culture serves that. If you teach only culture, and Buddhism very soon disappears. Even if in the form it's there, history is there, scriptures are there, but the essence is not there. So if you teach the essence that transcends culture, then everything else serves it. And people will believe you. I, I have one other question. I, I watched it, uh, on YouTube your interview with uh, Susan Lee. You said, I can't live uh, my father's life. I, I can cannot live my yeah, father's life. I cannot life. That's uh, live my only life. 
Yes. Uh, what does it mean then? Sentence? Well, that means yeah. that you cannot be just the result of your upbringing and cannot fulfill your parents' dreams. If you cut your hair, you left your family, you're no longer your father's son in that sense. You do not follow your father's karma. You follow the Buddha's way and you are one of the Sok. I am your brother. I am Sok Chongan. You are Sok. <laughs> Welcome. So we are in the Shakyamuni Buddha's family. We changed family when we cut our hair. We fulfill different expectations. So that means I cannot live my father's life. It's not my path. Even if you are in a lay life, you cannot do that. But it's closer because you do not change your family karma. You are a descendant and you will be somebody's ancestor later. And my only life means if you have a very different karma from your parents, you have to recognize it and own it and live it and use it correctly. Uh, Sunim, you introduced uh, three different types of practice like uh, bowing and chanting and, and sitting. Uh, sitting or that meditation. Yes. But for the Westerners, they are not accustomed to bow many times. And then some people might think that we are bowing in front of the idol or statue of the Buddha. So okay. when you were first introduced to bowing, you what didn't have Western any... What does Western culture do? It projects. <laughs> yeah. Use that. So mm -hmm. the Buddha statue is a projection. Mm -hmm. It's a projection of your Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. It's not bronze that you bow to. It's not wood that you bow to. Mm -hmm. It's not plastic or gold plate that mm -hmm. you bow to. Mm -hmm. You bow to everybody's Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. And that means your karma goes down, Buddha nature goes up. Ooh. When they ask Sung San Sinim, what is bowing? He says, leave your karma behind, you and this universe become one. Mm -hmm. Finished. Okay. That's it. So when you are asked to bow so many times in the no, first place? No, you're not asked. Okay. So you are you instructed to bow three times before Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Uh -huh. And then we have the option Okay. To bow back palbe, then two times back palbe, then three times back palbe, then chonbe, then some chonbe. Okay, we don't ask people to do that. Right. Why? Problem first. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the problem, you don't know the solution. Mm -hmm. So somebody approaches you with a huge emotional problem, is burning their hearts, okay? Mm -hmm. And you say, you have a choice. You want to have your heart burnt out or you want to recycle this energy? If you want to recycle this energy, you have to do two things. One is bowing, that is turning the energy to the right way. Sangi, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Then lower chi, lower the chi, as it goes down, 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 bowing does that. So breathe out, go down, breathe in, come up. And watch this, just watch the breath, no mantra, it's too much in the head. <laughs> that time, no yombul. Just watch the breath and bow. And then, as the key goes down, this emotional problem begins to disappear because there is no fuel, no hibalyu, okay? <laughs> so then it goes down, 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 and bowing does that. Bowing recycles this energy. That's secondary teaching. Primary is Buddha nature becomes stronger, karma becomes weaker. Then you attain oneness because bowing soon takes away thinking. If you don't make anything in the mind, bowing takes away thinking very quickly. But how to keep it without the body movement? That's why chanting and sitting are necessary. Use this. Use all the values that Western culture has and build on it and put the message into the right box. Then they will believe that. Closer. In Western, Closer. there are already so many kinds Closer. of yeah. Buddhism. Yeah. I mean, the. Tibetan Buddhism, yeah. Vietnamese, yeah. and Korean, Chinese, Japanese, so many, right? So I just wonder, as a you know, Western uh, yourself, uh, how the Korean Buddhism uh, appeals to the Western people? I mean, the, what, was, what is the position of the Korean Buddhism in Western nowadays? Do you drive a car? No. <laughs> but your Shindo does, right? Your Shindo buys a car. <laughs> How many cars are there in Korea? Millions. Maybe more than 20 million. You have 50 million people in Korea, maybe more than 20 million cars. But your Shindo wants his or her own car. That's how this car industry 
makes money. When we have this spiritual multiplicity and variety in the West, it doesn't mean that the market is totally saturated. There's always new people, always newcomers, and they need the fresh one. They need the fresh flower of the Dharma. So Mahakashyapa, as he saw the Buddha's flower, that was 2,560 years ago. We need a fresh flower now. And that's why we need even more. If we have another country suddenly becoming Buddhist and producing patriarchs and matriarchs and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, we need that. We need as many as we can because this variety makes us function like nature. And nature multiplies, varies and evolves. We need all the three. So if we had like 10 times more monks and nuns, we would still have jobs for them. 10 times more lay people teaching Buddhism, we would have jobs for them. Because there are billions of people who are suffering and they have no way out. So we can offer the way. And Buddhism is wonderful because we do not convert, we do not convince, we do not argue. We present, we manifest, we offer. And then we can be very useful. So yeah, Korean Buddhism is maybe another variety of Mahayana Buddhism, and there's of, of course Theravada, and there's Vajrayana, and many other kinds. We need more. Multiplying and producing variations means we can evolve, we can produce the next best version. We can adapt, we can develop. That's how nature works. And if you look at the forest, all the pine trees, they go towards the sky, but they don't argue. They don't argue about the sun, the rain, and the soil. And most importantly, one pine tree doesn't cut out the other pine tree. Humans do. Keep up the good work, Sunim. All right. So everybody, please, I really appreciate your attendance today, that we follow through the line of concepts and the web of the systematic approach. I'm glad we were able to improvise with the questions. And I want to express my sincere appreciation for what we are doing. Please, let us keep up the good work, our practice, our tradition, and I believe we can help a lot of people with this. Thank you very much.